My name is Mallory Ahrens. I'm the head of adult programming here at Darien Library, and it's my great honor to welcome you here this afternoon. I wanted to remind everyone that programs at the library are made possible by our annual contributions to the Friends of the Library campaign. We get to bring Mark back here a couple times a year, all because of donations. So thank you to the Friends of the Library. Today's guest is the historical research editor at Army Aviation Magazine and is a longtime member of the United States Naval Institute. In addition, he teaches history at Norwalk Community College. In May 2005, he was presented with a General Assembly citation by both houses of the state legislator in Hartford for his effort in commemorating the centennial of Battleship Connecticut. Please join me in welcoming back to the library, Mark Albertson. Good afternoon. And uh, another beautiful day in the neighborhood, despite all the hijinks that seems to be going on with the post-election here, Black Tuesday, if you want to call it that. Uh, this is uh, talk one, chapter one, if you want to call it that, of the Cold War. And today we're going to focus on the United States. Uh, specifically, we'll get into containment and Mr. George Kennan one of the probably post-World War II uh, ranking U.S. foreign policy uh, gurus, if you want to call him that. I like to call him a Sovietologist because that's virtually what he was. I guess helping to create that position if you want to go into that. He is considered the author of this, doc of this doctrine called containment. But to, before we get into that, I think it's a good idea to form some sort of background to how the United States got to this point in the first place. And a good place to start is, how about the Louisiana Purchase in 1803? That's going back a little ways, but it's a good place to start. Now, however way you slice this, however way you view this, this is an example of American imperialism. It's virtually what it is. You could say, well, we bought this territory from France, right? 1803. It doubles the size of the United States overnight. Doubles the size of this country overnight. And of course, the question comes up, well, why does Napoleon sell this in the first place? For 15 million bucks. He needed the money. He needed, the money. needed the money. Needed the money. Yeah, he did. One of the reasons is, didn't they get thrown out? Didn't the French get thrown out of Haiti? And when they got thrown out of Haiti, what happened? They lost a good percentage of the sugar trade. You know, sugar back, selling sugar was like, it's almost, almost as good as gold. Sugar was a desirable commodity. Well, how is he supposed to station troops in that area known as the Louisiana Territory? He's got to raise money. This is 183 for the upcoming war, the Napoleonic Wars in Europe. Needs money for that. $11,250,000 actually. The other, the other 3750000 was actually a forgiveness of French debt held by Americans, so that money doesn't even leave the country. These guys get paid off, and that's it. But here you see, the, the, here you see and it doesn't make any difference to the occupants of that territory or the inhabitants, let's put them that way, who live there. It doesn't make any difference if it's the Americans, the Spanish, the French, or even the British for that matter. Because who actually lives there? Indians? Yeah. Captive people, right? That's what they are. That's virtually what they are. They don't own the land, uh, really. However, we double the size of this country. You know, this is interesting, too, because not long after this, what happens? The War of 1812? Yeah, resumption with the war with the British. And the British are eventually going to, of course, that is a backwater to the more important event in Europe going on than against the Napoleonic Wars. Kind of a, um, we are caught up in this vacuum, if you will, as a backwater to the larger global agenda here. And that is, you know, when Napoleon is finally defeated in 1815, you know, the War of 1812 is over by then, but it's interesting here, after Napoleon is thrown out of Russia, and the British are going to come here to fight us and to get rid of the, finally get rid of this grimy thumbprint of a republic. Keep in mind, American Republic, this is, this is fascinating, the American Republic is considered quite radical for the era. 
almost like what Marxism-Leninism is going to be considered in the 20th century. It's a radical departure from the norm. And what's the norm? Monarchs. The regal system of government. Isn't Napoleon a backlash to that? Yeah, he is. Isn't Napoleon really, if you want to call him this, the first of the modern dictators? You could say that. Joseph Fouché, his secret police chief, is actually going to help set the model for what's going to come down the road. Like Heinrich Himmler? How about La Rente Beria? People like this. Joseph Fouché, interesting character, chief of the French security apparatus in Napoleon's France. However, you know, we are going to defeat the British in the end, I guess you could say that. The Treaty of Ghent, you know, the, the, when the British invade us in 1814, the idea here is to cut up the, uh, cut up the, I could say the colonies, the states. It's not the colonies anymore, it's the United States. Their invasion of, of northern the United States through Plattsburgh is a failure. However, they are going to burn Washington, aren't they? But they're going to be stopped at Baltimore. And as, the, and as the negotiators in Ghent are talking, it's actually, it's actually you know, going to be um, Marshal or, or Lord Wellington who's going to tell the negotiators, if we can't take northern New York and part of the Ohio Valley and control the Great Lakes, we are not going to defeat the United States. Let's make a deal. Of course, what happens after the Battle of New Orleans? That kind of gets lost in the shuffle here because the Battle of New Orleans actually occurs after the treaty is signed. Although we all like to talk about Andy Jackson and how to put him on the map. But the fact of the matter is, what's interesting about this war, I mean, what causes a lot of wars? Loss of territory? You know, some people get very antsy about losing territory. I want it back. The great thing about the War of 1812 when it's over, nobody lost territory. We didn't lose any, and the British didn't lose any. They don't lose Canada. They don't lose Canada. So what is there to fight over in the future? Is there anything to fight over? No. Interesting, how we, interesting when you step back and take a look at this. And what is this going to do afterwards? You know, the British and Americans are going to sit down and discuss fishing rights off Newfoundland, 1815. How about 1817, the Rush Bagot Treaty? You know, the British were going to remilitarize some of the Great Lakes, their side. And the United States sits down with them. Wait a minute, why, why would we want to do that for? They agree. Start with Lake Champlain. Each side agreed they would have one 100-ton Navy vessel of an 18-pounder gun. They agree to the same thing for Lake Ontario and two such ships, two such ships in the, of the other Great Lakes. They sit down and discuss this. 1818, agreement on the Oregon Territory, a joint occupation. They agree to this. They also agree to the border, the Canadian-American border, almost which exists today out to the Oregon Territory. They sit down and they agree to this. There's really no reason to fight. Of course, let's understand one thing here from the British point of view. They're moving into the Middle East. They're moving into the Middle East, been doing so since 1763. Why? They want to plug that gap, the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. They're afraid, they're afraid mainly Tsarist Russia at this point. This is where you're beginning to see the great game begin to take place here between Tsarist Russia and Britain. And the British see the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, especially with the weakening of the Ottoman Empire, that they won't be able to stop the Russians from coming down those two rivers into the, into the Gulf, Persian Gulf through the Strait of Hormuz. And there you are, the Arabian Sea, colonial India. Okay, let's fill that gap. And they're moving their Indian Empire west into the Middle East. It's going to further help undermine the Ottoman Empire. That's what you're seeing develop here. This leads, and this is interesting, because no, we don't really, really talk about this. How the idea of this thing called Iraq, which doesn't exist at this point, it's Mesopotamia. But Mesopotamia and the surrounding area influences the development of America. Why? The British don't want to come back here. They're too busy in the Middle East. Spain, they're declining as a power. 
France, they're not going to come back here. You know, and, and as Napoleon III takes root in France, what is he doing? He wants to get involved in the Middle East. He wants to get involved in, in Asia, Southeast Asia, Vietnam, French Indo, which is going to later be known as French Indochina, although he will. What is he going to do later on, though? Isn't he going to set up shop in Mexico? Yeah, he is. He is in so-called violation of the Monroe Doctrine. But you see here, going into the 1820s, America virtually unfettered, untrammeled, not even bothered here, and beginning to expand. Economically as well, we're beginning to expand. We don't have to be concerned with being invaded at this point. Interesting turn of events here. The Seminole Wars, we're eventually going to get Florida, or take over Florida. Mexican-American War, we're eventually going to get the, the, the Southwest, correct? Yeah, we are. Mexican-American War. However, you know, again, the British like to keep an eye on things here. <laughs> of course, I always remember, what was it? I think it was John Quincy Adams who, you know, when they signed the treaty again, said, I hope this is the last treaty we ever have to sign with the British. Has he been right for 200 years? Yeah, he has. What was there to fight over? However, in 1850, this is interesting. Now, the British, you know, the British being the world's ranking colonial power, uh, know how to read a map. And they understand this growing power of the United States. More whalers and traders are going into the Pacific. We're beginning to increase our influence in the Caribbean and beyond. And if you step back and take a look at a map, what would, that, what would that lead you to think? That perhaps once we get to the west coast, instead of going all the way around South America, wouldn't that behoove us to try to build a canal through Central America? Mm-hmm. Well, we don't want the British to do it either. So they sit down. The clayton Bulwer Treaty of 1850. Neither side will build a canal in Central or South America without the acquiescence or even the support of the other. Here, the British slow down American expansion. They know they really can't stop it. They're too busy, over, they're too busy in the Middle East and preserving, and preserving their empire. So let's slow down America's rate of growth. That treaty will remain in force until the hague Pantsport Treaty of 1901, where the British actually give up their so-called rights and what's going to happen about 10, 12 years later? The Panama Canal. Interesting. Interesting what you see here. We have the Civil War, right? 1861, 1865. You know, I saw a survey not all that long ago, and they were asking some of the younger set about uh, the Civil War. And the question, it's how the question's phrased here. It's not just history, it seems like it's mathematics too. It's the way the question's phrased. The Civil War occurred between what part of the 19th century, 1800 to 1850, or 1851 to 1900? Half got it wrong. I mean, when I went to school, 1861 to 1865 would fit in that era of 1851 to 19, 1900? Anyway. But yes, the, the, the Civil War here, and this, the Civil War is interesting because the, the country at one point seems like it's tearing itself apart, right? One of our biggest boosters is Tsarist Russia. One of our biggest boosters. They want Abe Lincoln to beat the South. They don't want this country torn apart. You go, well, what, 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 what does that matter to Tsarist Russia? A lot, because Tsarist Russia lost the 1853-1856 war, the Crimean War, to the British, the French, and the Ottomans. And they didn't get any help from Prussia or Austria. The two other countries that, 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 that were supposed to be part of the Holy Alliance. The Holy Alliance was a sub-alliance that was formed after, after the Congress of Vienna. They didn't get any help from Prussia or Austria. Of course, they're setting themselves up for competition to control the German states. But they got no help. 
You know, one historian, and he might have a point here, that if the Austrians and Prussians had supported the Russians against the British, the French, and the Ottoman Turks, maybe that would have been the Great War. Interesting. Interesting synopsis there. Because even without that, a half a million men will be killed in 33 months in that war, in the Crimean War. Nobody ever talks about that war. Nobody ever talks about that war. However, Tsarist Russia sees America as a potential ally down the road. So why would they want to see a split? Interesting. Already, America is being viewed, being viewed as a potential ally by a great, well, we'll call them a great power overseas. A draconian power. I don't know. It's not democratic. They don't have a democratically elected government. The czar runs this. Interesting. Fascinating. Of course, at the same time here, Abe Lincoln is faced with a foreign policy dilemma. The French, as I alluded to earlier. You know, Napoleon III looking to resurrect France as a great empire or a great world power. Bring France back. Sets up shop in Mexico, right? Kicks out Don Benito Juarez. Juarez takes to the hills. Guerrilla warfare. Well, there's not much Lincoln can do about this. There's not much he can, he's got to fight the Confederacy, which has set up shop down south. He's got to fight this war, four years. However, you know, 1865, 1865, Lincoln's, Lincoln's been assassinated by then after April 1865, the new president, Andrew Johnson, sends 50,000 Union troops down to the Texas border under the command of General Phil Sheridan. There is a possibility here that America can go to war with the French to enforce the Monroe Doctrine. That would have been an interesting conflict. Doesn't happen. Why? Events in Europe. Otto von Bismarck will finally unite the German states at the expense of Austria to the advantage of Prussia, 1866. And Napoleon III sees the handwriting on the wall. Uh-oh, I better bring him home. And he brings the French troops back to France. And what happens to Maximilian? Without that French army, he'll be, set, he'll be shot, 1867. But there's no war between the United States and France. However, as the colonial powers are extending themselves into Asia, the Middle East, and after the Berlin Conference of 1885, they will carve up Africa, which before this point, some like 80 or 85% of Africa was still independent. Of course, by, the, by 1900, 90% of it will be under the, under the sway of the European colonial powers. We will send an observer to that. We will send observers to that conference in 1885 in Berlin, but we will not really take part. We do not get anything out of Africa at that point. Just observation status. However, after 1865, you know, the country really begins to take off, developing itself industrially. This is a country that's going to go from having 144,000 factories or centers of production to 335,000 by 1900. We're virtually left alone here. We will continue that thing called manifest destiny, that expansion west of the Mississippi River, until Chesapeake Bay is linked with the Golden Gate. Industrial production again. In 1850, this country will produce $2 billion worth of goods. By 1900, 11 billion. Five, over five times we advance in five decades. Country's growing by leaps and bounds here. And this idea of isolationism, which Americans were all for after the 1812 war, after 1865, is being undermined by events on the world stage. Keep in mind here, one of this is, one of this is the American merchant marine. Very important. And we don't, we don't understand, we don't remember this, but it's very important. In 1860, America had a merchant marine of 2,500,000 tons. 72% of all American goods being shipped were shipped in American hulls. 
By 1913, that will be down to 9%. Merchant marine is wild to languish. However, if the country is producing all these goods, and it's, it comes, it, it's, it's interesting, the bankers, businessmen understand that the American economy cannot absorb all these goods. So what do you have to do with them? Export them? Yeah. And so if your merchant marine is doing this, and the amount of products you're producing is doing this, how do you get those goods overseas then? Foreign flag carriers? Mm-hmm. Yes? Wasn't it mostly after the Civil War a great influx of immigrants? Because with Manifest Destiny, you needed some, you needed a population to move west, especially after the gold rush in California. Oh, yeah, you had lots so of people, people here before. Just coming in like crazy. Correct. You had a lot of people come here, Irish, German, so on and so forth. And sure, you did. And, and a lot of them sure. were buying up goods and services that we didn't have to worry and about. And looking to better their lives west of the Mississippi sure. River. Correct. That's going on too here. So, does that undermine so called isolationism? Of course it does. Of course it does. However, the businessman and the banker is not isolationist. If he understands that he can't sell all, or these people understand they can't sell all their goods stateside, what are they going to do with them? Export them. Well, if you don't have the merchant marine to, and railroads can't cross the Atlantic, it doesn't work that way. Ships have to do that. And this, this is the essence of what? Globalization? You know, if the world was being traversed by wood and sail in 1750, do you think you're going to insulate yourself from globalization in 2016? I don't think so. I don't think that's happening. So yes, it's fascinating what you see here. Absolutely fascinating. But as America continues to grow, again, unfettered, unbothered here, we are growing as a power to the point that by the mid-1890s, we are the world's ranking economic power. And not just industrial production. What about feeding people? Mm -hmm. All the grain we produce, all the corn we produce. An industrial power that does this, does this too. Fascinating. Although by 1900, you know, half the American public still lives on farms. Although that's going to change, you know that. How many people in this country actually live on farms now? 2% maybe? Wow. And we can still produce all this food. That's if the rainforest survives in the, in the Amazon, which, are, which is the lungs. <laughs> if that doesn't survive, uh oh, that's an issue. That's an issue. That's another talk. But you see here also not just economic power, foreign affairs. If we are taking our place on the world stage, you know, and we, are, and we cannot absorb all these goods, and we're fostering relations overseas, business and banking, how do you protect that? A military? American military power will follow American economic power. And that brings the Spanish-American War. America is attempting to cut its colonial roots. We're no longer a colonial backwater. We are now taking our place on the world stage. That's exactly what we are doing here. We began, we, if you want to get down to this militarily speaking, we began this in the 1880s when we, built, when we started building the new steel navy. We're modernizing the navy. And whenever a country wants to buy or build a larger navy, what are they looking to do? Extend influence outside their borders? China come to mind today? Mm -hmm. This has been repeated over and over and over. Royal Navy come to mind here? How about the Spanish Empire? Didn't Germany try this? Gee, how about the Imperial Japanese Navy? Let's not forget that one. And even the Soviets with their blue post-World War II Blue Water Navy tried this. So whenever you see a country buy and build a larger navy, they are looking to extend influence outside their borders. 
And for us, it's virtually a must. Don't we separate the Atlantic from the Pacific at one point here? Yes, we do. Does that mean we need a two ocean navy? Strategically speaking, if you're taking your place on the world of, in world affairs, yes. Spanish-American War, here's an example here. You know, we go to war with the Spanish, which are a declining colonial power. This is the way to start. You know, you start with the minor leagues. You're not, you're not going to go to the major leagues right off the bat here. You start in the minor leagues. The Spanish are declining. They're declining. The U.S. Navy actually puts in a pretty good show in this, in this short, sharp conflict. The Army? Eh, that needs work. Everyone loved the Navy. In fact, Congress will appropriate $50 million for this war. Gee, that sounds like chump change today. $50 million for a war. $30 million will actually go to the Navy. $20 million to the Army. The Navy, again, puts on a pretty good show. They rule the waters around Cuba, allowing the Army to defeat the Spanish Army. Same sort of thing in the Philippines. Admiral Dewey, Manila Bay, yeah. Yeah, the Army needs work. Now, the Army is interesting because the Army, you know, at, a, at, at the end of the American Civil War, we have an Army of 2,213,000 men. Two mil That's unheard of in North America at this point. And it's not this citizen militia type Army. It's a conventional Army, having fought a conventional style of war. Yet in two years, it's going to be down to 57,000 men. By 1874, down to about 26,000 men. Because, the, because many in Congress believed in what the Founding Fathers uh, sa stated, that they don't want a large standing army. It's a threat to the Grand Republic. However, if you're taking your place on the world stage, can you take your place on the world stage and protect your interests overseas with a citizen-soldier concept? No, that's not going to work. And so this army of regulars that we had just before the start of the Spanish-American War, 26,000 men. That's it, 26,000 men. And what is their combat experience? Chasing Plains Indians out west. Well, now you're going to be fighting a colonial power. How's that going to work? So what does McKinley do? You know, we're going to call up the citizen soldiers, right? Well, you know what some of these governors say? My guys aren't fighting outside their state borders. Imagine if Malloy tried to say, my guys aren't going to Afghanistan. How far is that going to get? And so what happens here? The call goes out for volunteers. Now, that's 150,000 volunteers. Now, if you have an army of regulars of 26,000 men, what is your logistics system geared to? 26,000 men. How do you think a logistics system for 26,000 men is going to work with 180,000? Yeah, that's a problem. It was a monumental effort to move men from Tampa, Florida to Cuba. A monumental effort. You imagine being in a hold with an unair conditioned rust bucket with mules? I don't think I'd want to make that trip. That 90 miles probably would have felt like 9,000. But it's a starting point. And so when the war is over with, President McKinley will hire Elio Root, a New York lawyer. Has no military experience, good organization man. Comes out with the Root reforms. Interesting. If this is an, this is an overt sign of America changing itself. 1901, we will now have an Army War College. We already had a Navy War College for almost 20 years. We'll now have an Army War College. We will now have a general staff a real general staff. We will now no longer have the citizen soldier concept. That's gone based off the 1792 Militia Act. The National Guard Act of 1903. No longer will these guys buy their own guns. Now guess who's going to buy the guns? Washington. And now these so-called citizen soldiers, now the National Guard, will have to meet and train with the Army regulars five days a year and meet on their own 24 times a year. 
That will be changed by 1916 from five days to 15 days training with the Army and from 24 days to meet 48 days. And they will be paid for this. And what's happening to the power of the governors? They're losing this power and it's being transferred to Washington. This is called the growth of central control. That's what you're seeing here. Teddy Roosevelt's going to send the great white fleet around the world, December 16, 1907. And they'll return to Hampton Roads on February 22, 1909, George Washington's birthday. This is Teddy Roosevelt's announcement to the world that America is now a global power. First we're an imperialist power, now we are a global power. Interesting trip. They were all coal burners, folks. 14 months and 6 days they go around the world. They will crisscross the equator 6 times. Call on more than 30 ports. And log over 46,000 miles. You know, it's interesting about, this is before the Panama Canal, so they had to go all the way around Central and South America. What's interesting here is, you know, th these, these ships really aren't air conditioned. And some of these places, like in South America, or even in the Philippines, uh, they, they began to accumulate examples of, of the animal life here. And uh, when they went to Bremerton, Washington alone, when they stopped there, the people gave each of the ships a bear cub as a mascot. Now I don't have to tell you how it must have been life like in some of these uh, in some of the tropics when you have uh, some bears and monkeys and so on and so forth on these ships with the guides. <laughs> Challenging. Quite Challenge. Difference. Bigger pardon. Quite a difference. Yes. Mm -hmm. There's been a certain error about this trip. But it's an announcement to the world. You know, Teddy Roosevelt wanted to do this like a 19-2. You know, when you have six battleships, everyone's going to what? Yawn? You send 16 around the world, everyone wakes up. America now is considered on the world stage. Of course, Teddy Roosevelt is going is to politically help us on the world stage in 1905 when he brokers the deal following the Russo-Japanese War. Kind of a forerunner of what Mr. Wilson's going to do in 19, 1919. But again, America's taking its place on the world stage. We are growing as a power. First World War, what you call the First World War, we're going to get involved in that one. And again, I mentioned this in earlier talks. April 6, 1917 is one of the decisive days in American history because what you saw coming out of the Spanish-American War, America becoming a recognized colonial power, we get the Philippines out of this, we get Guam out of this, Cuba becomes a free nation if you believe that one, and we get Puerto Rico. Round the world cruise, great white fleet, gee, now we're a global power. Congress codifies this on April 6, 1917. It took them four days to deliberate this. Woodrow Wilson asks for this declaration of war April 2nd. They don't give it until the 6th. Of course, that's what the president is supposed to do per the Constitution, right? Isn't he supposed to go before Congress and ask for the declaration of war that's in our Constitution? They do that anymore? What happened to that one? <laughs> Interesting what you see here. So now we're involved in this war. We are taking our place on the world stage, but like after the War of 1812, like after the Civil War, in 1919, Americans don't want to take part. Again, this isolationist stance, this isolationist mentality. But again, the businessman and the banker's not isolationist. We loan the British and the French 10, 12 billion bucks. Bankers want it back. You're not going to get it back if you're going to be isolationist. So while the average American Joe wants to go back to the farmer's job that he had before he went off in uniform, this is man of the banker, now even the army now, taking their place on the world stage. Keep in mind when this war is over with, there's a growing friction now beginning, it's been developing, between the Japanese and the Pacific. As the British retrench as a global power, somebody's going to fill that void in the Pacific. It's going to be the Japanese and the Americans. Isn't that going to help lead the Pearl Harbor? Yeah, it is. That is. That's what happens on the world stage. There is a byproduct known as war. <laughs> happens sometimes. 
Happens sometimes. But it's too late to turn back. This is not explained to the American public. It's not explained. It should have been, but it's not. You know, you know Woodrow Wilson signs the Versailles Treaty, which means we should have taken part in the League of Nations. But of course, the Senate, you know, he can sign all the treaties he wants. Again, what does it state in the Constitution? Senate has to ratify these treaties? Do they ratify the Versailles Treaty? No. Henry Cabot Lodge leads the charge against that because he does not like Woodrow Wilson, and that feeling is reciprocated. They don't like each other at all. Interesting what you see here. Do you know, it's interesting, you know, I, I was giving a talk on, on, on Veterans Day, the, the history of Veterans Day, and um, Woodrow Wilson wanted, it wasn't supposed to be a holiday, in 1919, a year after Armistice Day, well, it was November 11, 1919, wanted Americans to remember what the, Ameri what the veterans did in the First World War, just to take two minutes out of your day, this kind of thing. And you know, do you know we were technically still at war with the, with the, with the Central Powers? It's not going to be until July 1921 when Congress finally passes a resolution, hey, you better make peace with the Germans. Mm -hmm. And so on August, 20, August 25, 1921, Germany and the United States will sign an agreement stating that the, what, the war between us, to, uh, between uh, Germany and the United States is over. And yet what's interesting here is, they do not sign it with Imperial Germany. It's the Weimar Republic. It's not Imperial Germany anymore. That's not the end of this. Wasn't there Austria-Hungary? Yeah. Well, there is no Austria-Hungary. So now August 24, 1921, we have to sign a separate agreement with the Austrians. And then on the 29th of August, we have to sign another agreement with Hungary. Now the war is over. Interesting. Interesting. How not, by not ratifying the Versailles Treaty, it left that loose end open. Three loose ends, actually. You went from two to three. Because Austria-Hungary no longer exists. It's Austria and Hungary. But you see America, again, taking its place on the world stage here through the 20s and the 30s, going into the Depression. Now, what's interesting here is Mr. Kennan. He's born in 1904. 1904. His mother will die two months later from peritonitis, from a burst appendix. And he always thought, well, he thought for quite a few years after that, his mother died having him. He always kept that guilt with him. Interesting. Interesting. He didn't, get, he didn't quite get along with his father. Didn't get along too well with his stepmother, yet he will go live with his stepmother in Germany for a while. And there he's going to begin to learn German. He will come back to the United States. will go to St. John's Military Academy in Dallafield, Wisconsin. He's actually born in Milwaukee. He will wind up going to Princeton University, second half of 1921. Does not, he, academically he does OK, but he doesn't, he doesn't, um, he doesn't hit it off too well with, with many of his uh, fellow students because he, he's not enamored with the elitist atmosphere at, in, the, in, these, in this Ivy League school. He will get a bachelor's degree by 1925, was thinking on going on to law. However, the new US Foreign Service needs people. Takes the test, passes the test, goes to foreign service classes and he will be sent to Geneva in 1928. Later be tra transferred to Germany. He will continue his education with the Foreign Service. This is a man who's going to be, learn to speak Russian, and this is huge. Actually, he's actually going to learn, besides his own native English, he will learn to speak German, Russian, Norwegian, Czech, Hungarian, Polish. Wow. Wow. He winds up in Russia, or in, in, in Riga, Latvia, in 1931. 
He's doing, uh, he's doing economic research. Keep in mind, over in Eastern Europe, of course, keep in mind the Depression is already in full, full bore at this point. But in 1933, the Roosevelt administration, right, Kennan will accompany William C. Bullitt to Moscow. We're going to set up shop. We're going to set up uh, an ambassadorship here. He goes with Bullitt begins to do a lot of research on Russia. He actually had, he actually had a relative who had been departed by that point, uh, a cousin of his grandfather, who was also named George Kennan, who was actually an expert on czarist Russia. He wrote a book in 1891 on the czarist Russian prison system. And so uh, uh, George, George F. Kennan, the one we're really talking about, the F stood for Frost. George Frost Kennan. What a name. And from his grandfather's cousin, he becomes like a chip off the old block, if you want to call it that. And he really begins to research. Keep in mind, 1933, 34, 35, 36, the purges are starting, right? Yeah. He becomes a great source of information on the purges. Really gets into studying the purges. And this is going to color his outlook on the Soviet Union. Well, I'm sure it would color many people's outlook on the Soviet Union in the 1930s. He will be also, he will be also looked upon as a Soviet expert like Charles Boland later will, who will later wind up with the Truman administration, and Loy Henderson. They will be under the wing of a Robert Kelly, who is on the far eastern desk of the State Department. However, when Bullitt is relieved of the ambassadorship, Joseph Davies takes over. And Joseph Davies and Kennan don't quite hit it off. In fact, Davies says that perhaps Mr. Kennan should be relieved for health reasons. And George Kennan comes back here. He thinks of leaving the State Department, but he's given the Russian desk, so he stays. He will later be transferred out of the country again to Czechoslovakia, 1938, and is there to see. He goes there September 38. The Sudeten crisis. He will later be, he will, after that, will be transferred to Germany. He will be in Germany when the war starts. And actually, after the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor, he will be interned for six months, six months before he's returned to this country, mid-1942. He will be sent to Lisbon, Portugal, in September of 42. He feels that being a so-called expert on Russia, he's not being used properly. He's not being used properly. In January 44, he will be transferred to London. Again, he feels he's not being used properly. Avril Harriman will rescue him from obscurity. He will wind up in the Soviet Union. He is a big booster for a realistic look at Stalin's Soviet Union. When the war is over with, when the, it's, you know what's interesting here? <laughs> when the war was over, <laughs> uh, Avril Harriman, as our ambassador of the Soviet Union, representing this country, correct? You know, it, you, know, you know how these things go. Don't, don't these diplomats schmooze each other here at these meetings, right? Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> Avril Harriman says, uh, gee whiz, I want to congratulate the Soviet people for this great victory, and I want to congratulate the Soviet army for, for defeating the German army. I mean, they win the land war here. And he wants to congratulate Stalin for his leadership. Again, you know, this schmooze. Well, what do you think Stalin should say here? Gee whiz, I want to thank the Americans. I want to thank President Roosevelt. No, none of this. And he looks back at Harriman with a face with a face as bland as his floor, and he's, and he, because keep in mind the Soviets get to what Berlin and Prague, right? Start the Cold War, correct? He says to Harriman, he goes, "Tsar Alexander got to Paris." What would that lead you to think? 
If the troops don't land at Normandy, folks, what's to stop Soviet T-34 tanks from getting to the English Channel? What kind of a Cold War would you be looking at then? What kind of Cold War are you looking at then? That's an interesting take here. <laughs> and Mr. Kennan states, you know, Kennan is the type that believes it makes no difference if it's Tsarist Russia, if it's Stalinist Russia, if it's, Mr. If it's Khrushchev's Soviet Union, if it's Brezhnev's Soviet Union, and he will live long enough, he will die in 2005. So he will see Putin's Russia. Russia is Russia. And so he will, he will observe this. And it's interesting. Again, you know, he feels like he's not being listened to by the Truman administration. And so in early 1946, the Treasury Department is asking the State Department, we, need a, we want to know why Stalin won't latch on to the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank. What is it about the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank that Stalin doesn't like? They want to report on this. And who's going to get a chance to do this report? George Kennan. This he will send to Washington in what is famously known in diplomatic circles as, in 1946, the Long Telegram. That's what this is known as. It's a 5,500 word, some people say it's 8,000 words, report on the Soviet Union. Interesting how this telegram reads. This is the basis of what's going to come in 1947, an article he will write in Foreign Affairs when he comes back home. This will form the doctrine known as containment. Kennan is a firm believer that the Soviets are not the threat, as, as Nazi Germany later was. They're not interested at this point in world domination. Keep in mind some of the, preva the prevailing thought in some people here is, oh, Christmas. Hitler's gone. Now who do we have? Stalin? Kennan says, no, that's wrong. They're not bent on world domination. <clears throat> what did Stalin want? Number one. Number one, security. That's why he's not going to pull out of Eastern Europe. Now keep in mind, look at this from the Soviet point of view. They had been invaded through, what, Poland and, U and, and Ukraine in 1914 by, by, by Imperial Germany. They were invaded again in 1919 by the Poles. They were invaded again in 1941, the big one. Hitler invades the Soviet Union, triggering the greatest land war we've ever seen. Upwards of 30 million people will die in, in 47 months. <laughs> you know, so when you lose millions and millions of people in 30, 31 years, even your people are going to say, enough is enough. We've occupied Eastern Europe, and we're not getting out. If you don't like it, there's the door. Get out. We're not leaving. He understands this. He also understands that the Soviets at this point are no in position to indulge in world conquest. You lose 25 million people, you're on your way to world conquest at this point? I don't think so. It's not going to happen. And so his doctrine of containment means, number one, our superior economy. That's virtually our ace in the hole here, the American economy. We can help contain the Soviet Union with our economy. Gee, how about our more palatable political alternative? Who do you think people should gravitate to? The United States or the Soviet Union? Expert use of propaganda, special forces and intelligence if we need to use it. But we don't need to go to war. And we do not need to build a huge military complex to perform this doctrine of containment. He's later going to be, you know, some people are going to criticize this as seeing it as a more militaristic approach to keeping the Soviet in line, Soviets in line. 
He'll be on an interview on CNN in 1996, and he says, that's not, that's not what this was about. I did not want a militaristic approach. I wanted a more balanced approach. Why should we turn ourselves into a garrison state? We don't need to. Is he right? Yeah, he was. He was. James Forrestal will bring him home. Remember, Forrestal has a, more, uh, has a more draconian look at the Soviet Union, but he'll bring him home from the Soviet Union. However, it's going to be George Marshall, who as Secretary of State will really bring on George Kennan because he will put him in charge of the State Department's policy planning. George Kennan will also be the co-author of the Marshall Plan. He sees Europe and he sees even Japan. One of the reasons, you know, it's nice to say, well, we saved the world with a Marshall Plan. You know, we dug these, we got these people to dig themselves out of a hole. Yes, but for what reason? And Mr. Kennan understands this. You know, we have this huge industrial complex we've built, and you've got, you know, you've got 16 million, 112,000 Americans in uniform. Only 1.2 million are going to stay in. How are you going to find jobs for 15 million guys? You're going to convert your economy from a wartime economy to a peacetime economy. We're not going to be making as many tanks anymore. You know, they stopped making the last car in this country in February 1942. So many people are keeping that 36 Chevy or Studebaker running all through the war. Aren't people going to want new cars? Yes. Yes, they will. However, are we, again, this is the 19th century mentality of these capitalists. We have this wonderful economy, but are, is your population going to be able to absorb all these goods? No. So what are we going to do? We need to fashion a global economy to absorb whatever the American public can't buy. And what does that mean? Europe and eventually Japan. These are markets for our goods. It's nice to say, well, we saved their bacon. For, save their bacon for who? Them or us, or is it both? You need to create these markets. It's simple here. Simple. One of the reasons you had the, the Marshall Plan. However, when Mr. Marshall is no longer Secretary of State, Dean Acheson takes over. And him and Kennan will not hit it off too well. Acheson has a more militaristic outlook toward the Soviet Union. The so let's put it this way, our Cold War competitor. Let's call it that. And he will bring on a man by the name of Paul Nietzsche who will write a document, NSC 68, which has a more militaristic approach. And Kennan argues this is too rigid too simplistic, too provocative. Do you know George Kennan is against keeping American troops in Europe? He says if you want to foster a relationship with the Soviet Union, pull the troops out of Europe and bring them home. That's what he says. There are some that are going to go with that. But again, he understands the Soviet phobia, which exists today. Mr. Putin is an example. And Mr. Putin is going to use that for the current situation. Again, Mr. Putin understands here. You know, Stalin did this too. Again, occupying Eastern Europe. Why? They've been invaded three times through the same area. Let's plug the gap. Let's plug this gap. Again, Mr. Putin understands this. But this is this old Soviet phobia of being surrounded. It's existed for centuries. And if you understand this history, shouldn't it prepare you better to, uh, to, to, to have relations with this country? One would think. One would think Korea. The Korean War. You know, again, this competition is heating up. The Czechoslovakians. Soviet coup there, make sure the Czechs stay in the Eastern Bloc. The Soviets will blow their first atomic bomb, 1949. China will fall to Mao. He'll win the Civil War, 1949. The French, by 1950, aren't doing too well in North Vietnam. 
And then Kim Il-sung will cross the border. Now what's interesting about the Korean War is, you know, they almost, the Allies almost get pushed off the Korean Peninsula, Pusan perimeter. Then MacArthur lands troops in Incheon, they push the North Koreans out, here's where the debate starts. Okay, let's cross the 38th parallel and put pay to this Pyongyang regime and unite the Korean Peninsula under Syngman Rhee's banner. Dean Rusk is for this. MacArthur is one of the leading, one leading the charge for this. The Joint Chiefs will latch on to this. Paul Nietzsche wants this. Truman will eventually go with this. George Kennan is one of those that says, no. Containment says, once you push the North Koreans north of the 38th parallel, that's where you stop. If not, the Chinese are going to get involved. Gee, you think? What did the Chinese say as, 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 as the UN troops got closer to the Yalu River? Don't come near the Yalu. Don't come near the Yalu. What's going to happen the day after Thanksgiving? 300,000 Chinese will call them volunteers cross the border, cross the frozen Yalu, and they'll push the UN all the way out of North Korea, down below the 38th parallel, until the UN reorganizes itself and pushes them back to the 38th parallel. And by the spring of 1951, a war that probably could have been over if they had stopped at the 38th parallel will be a stalemate for another two years. Was Mr. Kennan right? Yeah, of course he was. George Kennan will also tell Mr. Kennedy, don't go into Vietnam. Don't go into South Vietnam. What happened with that one? And then, in 2003, when he's going to be almost 99 years old, he tells George Bush, don't go into Iraq. He will live that long. He will die two years later, probably knowing he was right. But he helps to foster this thing known as containment. The idea here was, as he mentions, to allow the Soviet Union to mellow. This is a long-term progression here. And what's going to happen in 1989, 1990? What's going to happen to the Soviet Union? Aren't they going to fall apart? Yes. Did they go out in a blaze of blood? No. It falls apart. Was George Kennan basically right? Yes. It's interesting what you see here. Absolutely fascinating. As America takes its place on the world stage, and then a man like George Kennan comes along and tries to arrange American post-war policy to fit what he thinks is the world situation at the time. Does it change the country? Of course it does. America was changing before he was born for Pete's sakes. Interesting what you see here. Interesting what you see. Anybody have any questions or comments? Yes. When you take a look at the dissolution of the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. is it perhaps not correct in stating that the Soviet Union really collapsed under its own size? It stretches from Asia all the way to Europe. <laughs> you have so many diverse nationalities. Mm -hmm. You have people with different ideas. Economic uh, preferences range from one gamut to another, and it just was, the government itself was not able to hold all of these diverse populations together, nor did they want to, and now what we're seeing perhaps is the hope of Putin to gain back, I mean, you look at Georgia, you look at what went on in Ukraine, you look mm -hmm. at so many other places where the Russian bear is now putting its little tentacles into and the economy is still lousy. Well, you, you, you see here, but based on what you're saying here, again, going back to what uh, the Treasury Department wanted to know in early 1946, well, why doesn't Stalin want to latch on to the International Monetary Fund and World Bank? Well, Stalin understood Lend-Lease. Yeah. 
And he understood that. Let's understand what's going on here, too. You've already had what you call World War I. You've had a Great Depression, which was horrible. And you had, now you had World War II. How many shocks can a world like this take? How many shocks like this can it take? And so what you see coming out of the Second World War is we're the only game in town. So whose currency is the best currency? The dollar. The dollar, right. So the world's going to be set on the dollar. Stalin thinks, well, and he's, to a certain extent, he's right. Well, if we're going to go with the US dollar, don't we have to do what Washington tells us to do? And I'm not doing that. He's defiant, virtually defiant here, uh, like recently deceased Mr. Castro was. So yes, the, so you know when Hitler says war is economics, he was right. Isn't money part of the of the, the economy? Of course it is. Of course it is. But Mr. Stalin sees if I take the dollar, I got to do what Washington tells me to do, and that's not happening. Stalin had a had a had a had a long history of not be, liking being told what to do, and so he's not going to kowtow to the, to Washington. He's just not. And he's not going to allow the new Eastern Bloc to do it either. He does have an ace in the hole. And I'll get into this next week when I talk about uh, the, the next talk is the Bear Grows Clause. About that industrial uh, infrastructure they had behind the Urals. That's going to help propel the Soviet economy after the war. In fact, to give you an just one example before next week. Uh, when the Korean War started, you know, the Soviet Union wasn't as bad off, perhaps, as some people thought. Do you know there were upwards, you know, with the, with, with, with the material they were producing to help the Chinese and North Koreans? Do you know they were moving off the Trans-Siberian Railway over 11,000 tons a day? 11,000 tons a day. Of course, once this stuff got to Manchuria, which is not as well developed, there's a lot of back, backlog of equipment here. But 11,000 tons a day. Does that sound like something the United States could do? Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Fascinating. Yes? When you take a look at our policy in the Middle East, get to the Soviet Union, became Russian satellite state. And Russia began pouring more of money and influence into the Middle East. That was something akin to an economic containment. But now the whole region is so out of sync that it's imploding. So I think, would you think that economic containment is a viable policy to follow in some of these states where we don't want to put boots on the ground anymore? Well, keep in mind, you, you, saw, you saw what happened with central authority here. Go back to the, the uh, uh, Sykes-Picot agreement where the British and the French drew these borders. Uh, you know, they, they ran this area for quite some time. However, you know, after 1945, uh, the, the, the British and the French as power brokers, they're done. They're done. Someone else has to take over the mantle for Western colonialism. Guess what? You're picked. <laughs> this idea of Western policemen, translation, what does that mean? means we're the, we're the world, we oversee Western colonial interest. That's what that means. Henceforth, the reason you're the world's policeman. That's what this is. However, you know, as the world is playing catch up here, uh, you know, since the Second World War, we're no longer the only game in town. So does that mean a decline in American power? Yeah, you're seeing it now. You're seeing it now. And so what you saw after 1945 with people like Gamal Abdel Nasser, People who come along, these, 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 these theorists, these radical theorists like Saeed Qutb, who is considered a, a theorist for the future, uh, people like the Islamic State, Al-Qaeda, Jabhat al-Nusra, people like this. You see these competing factions here underneath America trying to keep control of these areas. Isn't that what Castro was in the end? Yeah, he was. He was. So if you're taking your place as an empire, uh, don't think this is going to be a one-way street. That's not how it works. Look what happened to Rome. Look what happened to the Assyrians. Look what happened to the Ottomans in the end. Look what happened to the Spanish Empire. 
you know, Spain is interesting because when Spain was occupied by Napoleon in 1808, how are they supposed to keep control of their empire if, they're, if they themselves are occupied? That's not going to work. And I don't care what anybody says. You know, when you talk about the decline of the French Empire, and I, and I, and I take odds with some historians who will say, well, you know, when the French lost in, in Dambian Fu in 1954, they were done. And then after that, what, Algerian 62? No. They lost when Hitler defeated them in June of 1940, when, Ju when Hitler dictated the peace terms. And that little railway car, Compiègne, France, in June 1940, the French were done. They were finished. Actually, you might be able to say they were finished by 1918, when a country loses like they did 1,565,000 dead in four years. They were kind of bled. And I'm not just talking blood. I'm talking emotion. No. So uh, you know, the, the, again, this is a long-term progression. It, it doesn't it doesn't change. But I always argue that you know, I don't think they lost in '54 or '60. They God bless you. They lost in they lost in 1940. And so again, they're occupied. You know, how are they going to hold on to these colonies when the war is over with? People like Ho Chi Minh, so on and so forth. You know, they've come too far to let the French come back. And so by 1954, they're thrown out. And again, who has to oversee the, the Western colonial mantle in Vietnam? We do. It's interesting what you see develop here. Again, this is all part of the, what you consider the Cold War. And when we come back next week, I'm going to talk about the rise of Russia. Russia. You did the rise of America. How about the rise of Russia? And I always found this interesting. You know, again, this, these, the parallel between these two countries. We were not like the British. We had this wide empire all over the world, right? Remember that one, the sun never sets on the British Empire? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we were actually an insular empire in the beginning here. You know, again, the Louisiana Purchase, didn't we expand first across this great continent? Yes, we did. What was Russia doing at the same time? They're a landlocked empire, too. And yet what's interesting here is they have this commonality, and they're the ones who are going to dictate the peace in 1945. Wow. Interesting here. Interesting how the politics changed, the snowballing of the Industrial Revolution. Yeah. Oil and large populations. These are three major reasons why the US and the Soviet Union are going to win the war by 45. Large populations, large industrial infrastructure, and indigenous supplies of oil. They didn't have to go get it, they had it. And Mr. Stalin understands this, as did Franklin D. Roosevelt. Yes? Yeah. Why did Russia sell Alaska? They needed the money. And, well, yeah, they needed money. They needed money. But they didn't sell it for much. $7 million. Yeah, seven. Yeah, seven million. I think. Yeah, seven million. I think it was. And uh, after the price of Louisiana. Yeah, but you know, the, Russia at this point too. Keep in mind, at one point they had portions of the Pacific Northwest. At one point, they were in like places like Idaho, Oregon, and so on. It's Northern California. And one of the reasons you're going to have that Oregon deal in 1818 between the British and the Americans, is the British aren't stupid. The British, you know, they, they, they know at this point with the War of 1812 over, they, and they're getting in the Middle East, they know they can't hold on to North America forever. Okay, so let's jointly occupy this territory with the Americans to help keep the Russians out. We'll work with the Americans to do that. And at the same time, at the same time, we'll prevent the Americans from invading Canada from the west when they get to the coast. Again, the, Brit the British know how to read a map here. They know how to read a map. Yes? Signing the three pillars that you just mentioned as to what makes a superpower, 
Oh, I mean with the United States and the Soviet Union? Yeah. Well, during the Second World War, yeah. well, they win that war because they had large populations, yeah. indigenous supplies of oil, and large industrial infrastructures. Okay, so moving forward, mm -hmm. do you see today other than the United States and Russia an emerging power that might become a superpower? Well, you're seeing, uh, you're seeing, you're seeing some now. The Chinese are one, India is another. But now, but now it's hard for just one country to dominate this. There's too many kibitzers in the game now. You know, there's too, there's too many competitors. I wouldn't count the Brazilians out when they get their act together either. Where does India get its uh, energy from? Well, they get a lot. They get a lot of their oil from the Middle East, which probably accounts for one reason why they'd want to buy or build a larger navy. And plus, if they do, if they if they do expand their navy. Uh, they can cut off Pakistan in, in, in a time of crisis, which the Pakistanis, I'm sure, will not like. And since they're both nuclear powers, does that bear watching? Uh huh. Of course, what's interesting about uh, Pak about uh, India is that they have, in a country this size here, they have one embassy and four consulates. In Afghanistan, which is not nearly the size of the United States, one embassy and four consulates. And so the Pakistanis are concerned. You know, we're, we're, we're always concerned here about what we're doing in Afghanistan. We'll take a step back and look at India. You know, if India can have some sort of importance in Afghanistan, that would put India one side, Afghanistan on the other, and where's Pakistan in the middle? Mm -hmm. So every once in a while, you hear about an Indian consulate being bombed or the embassy being attacked or whatever the case may be. That, that, that's not a surprise there. So again, you know, step back from the United States and look what's going on locally there. Interesting what you say. <laughs> Interesting what you say. And so yeah, India and Pakistan, uh, they're, they're, in fact, they had, a few border, they had a few border disputes not all that long ago, fighting. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what, number three or four, I think it is, over the past few months, if I'm not mistaken, I think. But uh, yeah, it's not, it's not hunky-dory between, uh, de between Delhi and Islamabad, believe me. But again, is that all coming at the end of the Cold War, or what you call the Cold War? Yeah, of course. Of course. So it's interesting what you see here. Otherwise, that's it.